yeah so basically the goal of today's session um will be to uh let me move these guys away first perfect you can still see my screen okay yeah great so the goal of today's session in short is i want people to be able to use figma as a tool that works for them i want them to build twice as fast use half the pieces essentially get the most out of this tool and kind of get it out of the way when, you know, it's driving you crazy and you need to focus on the bigger picture. So what I'm basically going to be going through today is uh, an example of a lo-fi prototype that's going into a hi-fi uh, stage and how we can build that up, get that set up so that we're not dragging pieces around. We're not repeating ourselves. We're not like going, oh no, that one thing is changed and now to change a hundred other things. So our goal is to build all the things, build them fast and build them smart. But to break that down a little bit, what we're going to be talking about today is we're going to be moving from a sketch to a workable prototype slash dev ready spec. We're going to use styles to smartly automate our changes. We're going to build components with good intent so that we don't have to go back to them and rework them. And we want to use power shortcuts as well. So I've got a keycaster up here. So you should be able to see any shortcuts that I'm using. Uh, I'm on a Mac, so uh, I will kind of a few times uh, make mention of the Windows alternative. But generally speaking, command is control, option is alt. Uh, little optimization hacks, particularly for components that I've discovered over time um, that can kind of have, sh you can use shared components and have other components underneath all built off like one one source. And then I'm going to go over just some stumbling blocks that uh, I've I found along the way, stuff that's kind of like held me up for hours at a time. Um, and then at the end, we'll open the floor to questions because I'm sure some people will have questions about their own prototypes or things they've encountered. Um, so earlier on today, I was chatting uh, with someone and they very kindly offered to uh, share their working prototype with me. Um, so they're working on a banking app and this is pretty much just a copy and paste of their page and this is pretty much what most people's pages look like albeit i would say this is a clean version i know my prototypes when i get started and i've got free flowing ideas um tend to start to scatter all over the place so what we see is you know we we have this nice flow going we've, we're kind of figuring out stuff and we want to get it to a more interactive high fidelity state um I'll pop open my interface there. Um, but you can see like we're building things quite fast. Uh, we can see by the blue outline that these are just frames. So if I go to edit one of these, um, there's no source, like these are individual uh, pieces. It's just to actually rebuild this um, is gonna take a lot of work unless we just think carefully about how we're gonna attack it. And even with high fidelity prototypes, you see it all the time where instances are detached or there's like interactive sections, but they're actually disconnected parts that have, that are using individual frames. Um, this is fine uh, when you're getting started, but if you want to like build fast or if you want to kind of get, not spend hours like tweaking prototypes, it's a good idea to kind of take a step back and think, okay, what are we going to do? How are we going to make this work? So we'll be taking a little look at this. Um, I'll be using this a few times as an example. So first things first, whenever we have an interface and we have some sketches drawn out or we're redesigning something, we wanna make an inventory of all the parts. Uh, so any component that we see, any part of a component, any icons used, lists, we really wanna just like get a notebook before we even touch Figma, get a notebook, write down a list of like, from smallest to largest, you know, what are all these, what are all these parts? And then where we can break down parts, um, we want to kind of, if it's a complex component, we want to try and piece it down into like individual atoms and then combine these where they make sense and give any, and when we start building, we want to give any common parts, some kind of link so that we don't end up having to change hundreds and hundreds of individual pieces. And we want to make a home for these as well. So. Right now, you know, there's a component up here. We've got components kind of down around here. Ideally, if we're working in a larger system, we'll use a separate library. But even if you are just working on one file, you're quickly sketching out, you really want to like find a home for these components and kind of create a common space. 
So if we can take this screen here, we've got a few pieces here just looking at it. So we've got uh, we've got some sort of nav bar here or these action items. I guess you could consider this as potentially one part. There's a title, there's a balance display, there's a little like drop down list, uh, an action list. There's a card here. And even in the card, we can see there's this uh, icon container with an icon in it. There's a headline, body, a link button another button are these two different buttons are they variants of the same button who knows and then we have uh transaction lists with the title and parts so if we kind of dissect this and look into the anatomy of this component what we really get is like this is what i'm talking about the inventory so we get this list of from the most basic pieces colors that are used and i've just given these some general names based on their position uh, the shadow is also another thing to consider. The card had a shadow here. We want to keep a track of that, and we want that to be something that we can uh, link. The icons that are used, um, this could potentially be from a set of icons. We want to keep a track of that as well. And even the different text values used. So we have our headline. We have a, potentially a display title here. Um, with the card, there's a few specific titles, uh, the font sizes. And uh, even with the link, there's, they're using a specific condensed italic style. And then the components themselves, even just logging them for now, you don't have to worry too much about how they combine, but just grouping them together in a way that makes sense. This really helps us get an idea of, okay, now from our sketch, we're getting a sense of what we have to build when we're thinking in terms of a more high fidelity system, which we could potentially be handing off to developers. And this is generally how I will always break down a new interface if I'm being asked to uh, improve it or I'm being asked to construct something new. I try to get a sense of like what are all the pieces of this interface and how can they how can we bring them together? Because this is really key when we start building components and we start building styles. We really want a sense of like where can things combine, uh, where can we potentially break down things? And because we what we want to do by the end of this is we want to be able to build reusable parts so that by the by the time I've constructed all of this into a new component set, I, I'm not even thinking about building anymore. I'm just using pieces. Like I drop a card in, drop two buttons in, that's and that's it. So I'm sure a few of you have heard of the atomic design system. Uh, to give you sort of a short overview of how that works, it's really just a framework. It's a, it's a guideline. Um, it's a really nice way of breaking down complexity into individual parts. So we have our atoms, which are basically anything that you can't break down anymore. So textiles, color styles, these are like singular pieces. You cannot break them down into anything uh, more. Icons, even spacing, if you're using consistent spacing, given those names or values, border radii, um, shadows, these are our atoms. These are our most basic pieces, which we build everything um, from. And then we have our molecules, which are our combinations of atoms. So basically any individual uh, self-contained component, which doesn't have another component inside it. So a button, basically a text in a container with some style, tension icon, uh, input fields. These are sort of our small pieces. And then we have our organisms, which are basically a combination of molecules. Um, so all of these things that we built up from our, um, our atoms, we have these extra parts now. We can combine these to create more complex components. Um, so for example, oh, I can see I've been, I've been copy paste cut out. Um, for example, like a, a plan card or a price card, which would have like a, a picture, a list, maybe another list, a, a button, another button. And um, these would be examples of organisms. Um, I actually built these diagrams in that sort of way. So these uh, these components up here have been built to create these icon sets. So there's kind of a bit of that at play here, uh, but I'll show you some real examples in a moment. So starting off with colors, uh, what we want to do first is figure out, okay, is there an existing color system? If not, then you want to try and organize groups of colors and establish some kind of naming convention. 
Um, this is really important because you don't want to be dealing with hex values and colors that look slightly the same in your eye dropping. It's, it's just a waste of time. It's inefficient. So take a look online, uh, look at different color systems. Um, I particularly like the IBM colors, uh, carbon color system. Um, so they use, uh, I'll actually show you really briefly. Um, they use, it's quite a complex system. It's quite a developed system, but they use these uh, gray 80, blue 60 as their core values. And then they have tokens for these. So tokens are kind of semantic names for This is quite a complex example. So for a hover secondary, we don't have to go quite that advanced. We can just start with our simple, um, simple color naming. But what I would say is just use an appropriate naming scope, especially if you're at the start of your uh, building your components and your styles. So for example, blue 500 is very explicit. It has a very explicit name. So blue 500 can't be a red. It's something like color primary. It indicates the function of the color but it can also be changed down the line if there is something that needs to be developed. And I would say start simple. You do not need to spend like days coming up with every tint and shade of every single color. Just keep it simple. The important thing is that you link these. So for example, um, I've got these, uh, I've got these swatches of these colors that I picked out from the um, example sheet that we saw. So you can do either of two things to build uh, color styles. You can select a, a, a layer that has that color. So here I see it's got a fill that's FFF, and this is our background color. So I'm going to click the four dots here. I'm going to click plus, and then I'm going to name that um, background. If I was using this for documentation purposes, or I knew that I was going to be hanging this off, I might just put in some extra description tag, uh, tag words. So I'll create that style. And then we can see uh, amongst our other colors that are here, there's background. Now, if you want to make this a little clearer for us and a little faster, what we can do is I'll remove that background color. I'll start again, um, go into the four dots, click color styles. Um, and I'll actually call this background slash primary. And that will automatically create a folder called background with a color called primary. So I can do this with these other colors. I'll just fire through it real quick. So for example, uh, text slash primary. I've got a card background as well. And because I don't know if that's gonna be a separate color to the main background, I'm gonna call it card background, icon background. And you can see if you have your swatches prepared out here, you've got your colors set up. Um, Looking primary, it doesn't take too long to build up your color system. And again, button secondary, because I'm using the slash, that's already going to pre-populate the folders. Um, so I think I've repeated the color there. So I'll just select this one and status positive. And status negative. So if I go back here, uh, you can see I've got all these colors set out. Now, what I see a lot of people do at this age is they start building their little uh, library of colors and swatches. One thing that's going to take so much time and it's going to be honestly a waste of your time is if you start doing this, oh, we're going to take the square, we're going to drag it open. Um, what was this? Button primary. And then you and then you go, oh, what's the hex value? It's 00856A. If you do this and you write all these things out and you create your nice, perfect little swatch like you saw on Dribble, and then a stakeholder goes, actually, we want this color to be different or we want to use different sets of colors. You're going to have to go back into this and you're going to have to rewrite potentially the naming scheme or you're going to have to rewrite the colors. What I would really recommend in this instance is go to your plugins menu, which you can do by pressing shift and I and search for um, a plugin called color style guide and just select run. Now you've instantly generated a whole swatch that has not only your hex colors, but your RGB values, your HSL values. 
and it's categorized them by folders if you did use folders. We had a few extra colors up here. Um, instant time saver. Don't waste time, you know, drawing this out piece by piece. Anytime a color changes, just delete this. Uh, go back to your previous page and run so again. What's that? Oh, um, so anytime um, you need to do that, uh, just when you have your colors generated, run color style guide. Uh, it's a really amazing Figma plugin. I've got it linked at the end. It's just going to save you so much time. I'm so sad when I see people, you know, spending like an hour making this lovely swatch only to have to redo it and the, the colors and the values desync. Um, so once you've got your color set up, great. You've got your swatches uh, set up. Then you can move on to typography. Um, and I would say, even if you don't know a lot about typography or you're still learning, just look at an existing typography scale, uh, look online. Like if you're designing for web, look at how uh, semantic uh, headlines work. So H1, H2, H3. If you do this now, you're going to save yourself such huge pain because if you need to make text changes and you're on multiple frames and you haven't set styles, you're going to have to go through every single instance and change it, even on, even if you're just building something up, you know, that isn't going to be a major project. Use textiles. Um, and I would say as well, um, to save yourself pain, like just use something that exists. Uh, I really like the material typography scale. I believe MailChimp have a very good one as well. Um, they have all the common uh, uh, headline sizes, including uh, line spacing. Um, and again, um, you can go in and do the same as before. Uh, and I believe I've already set up this. Yep. So as before, the same with Phil, just jump in there, click plus, um, pick your folder or don't use a folder, just use H1, H2, H3. And when you set that up from the same person who's done the um, color style guide, there is a typography style guide. And plugins like this just make Figma so powerful. Instantly, I did not have to do anything. Like I just had to run a plugin and I get my um, font size, uh, line spacing, uh, sample, and it also uh, highlights the descriptions. So if we go into, um, I have a folder here called bank, which I pre-populated. I put a description with all of these um, styles. This will pre-populate those descriptions as well. So you can provide documentation pretty much instantaneously. It, Plugins like this are just my favorite thing. Um, I used to do this manually. I used to set up my nice, neat auto layouts. I used to make everything perfect. And I probably spent, you know, about an hour and a half just doing that. Um, it's so unbelievably to be powerful. These plugins will generate another uh, a new page every time you run it. So what I recommend is when you're finished with it, um, just cut and paste this uh, into whatever library or file you're using and then delete the page. Um, so yeah, I, it's a really, it's a really fantastic, uh, tool. And another thing I would say is when you're, when you're starting to put together, um, your typography, uh, this isn't a must, um, but try to keep, uh, your line spacing, um, in a four, a four slash eight pixel grid. And I'll, I'll go into why that's really good, uh, towards the end when I show a few tricks, um, you really just want to keep things kind of consistent and not be dealing with odd values because anything that makes you go back and, and manually drag and pixel adjust, it's just going to drag you down and waste time when you just need to be building things and looking at the bigger picture. So um, in terms of style hacks and little things, um, uh, you can uh, use command option C, command option V, that's control alt C and control alt V to copy and paste styles. So Whenever you have a layer selected, um, you've got a bunch of these properties on the uh, right-hand panel. You can just uh, paste that into any other shape um, and you'll instantly get uh, all the values. And this is particularly useful because sometimes um, you want something like a dash stroke effect. Uh, dash strokes at the moment, as far as I know, uh, can't be saved to styles. So sometimes it's really handy just to have, if you have something like this set up, 
you can quickly paste it in. Um, it's a really fantastic shortcut. I use it all the time when I just need to quickly uh, transfer a style. It will also work for um, uh, saved styles. So let's say I have a H1 here. I can just uh, paste that style and it will retain the uh, the, the link style. Um, so particularly if you're fixing up a document where you missed uh, a few paragraphs or you mix, missed a few text layers where they weren't styled, if you have the style set already, you can just quickly paste those in. Uh, it's really handy. Um, and also super, super powerful is, you know, when you start a text layer and it's always defaulting to 000, zero um, and whatever generic uh, text style there is. Uh, mine doesn't do that because I set a default property. So this works for both shapes and texts. If you uh, start a layer and you set your styles, so in this case, uh, I'll set this to be white and H1. If I go into the Figma menu and I set default properties, the next text layer I type out will have those styles preset. So you can pop, you can create uh, content, you can start building things with your uh, styles preset. It's really useful if you're using a paragraph style a lot. And every time like you start doing it, you're like, oh, I have to make that color and I have to, I have to make that uh, text layer, the style it is. Um, it's super, super powerful. A thing that people forget as well is that images can be set as styles. Um, I have one here called Doggy. Um, it's essentially just a uh, an image fill. Um, so it does not have to be uh, like a, a filled style does not have to be a solid color. It can be a gradient. It can be any kind of gradient. Um, I believe it can be a video even, uh, although I haven't tried that. We might try that towards the end. Um, this is really powerful if you need to quickly uh, fill uh, an image that you got maybe from marketing and that you know you use. Setting it as a style um, and then using your um, your paste trick, you can quickly populate other containers, any container um, with that with that style. And if I then change that style, um, let's say I I need to use a different image. Um, I don't have another doggy image here, but I think if I go to the original uh, component here, and let's see, unsplash. Let's find a nice doggy. Oh, I believe I, I believe Unsplash is not replacing my doggy, which is a shame. So in that case, uh, let's change doggy to a gradient. And if I go back and reset all changes, Oh, huh. that isn't working uh, as I expected. That's unfortunate. Okay, we'll investigate that afterwards. Let's get our doggo back. But um, what I can do is I can change the image property. So right now I have doggy set to fill. If I set him to fit or if I crop the image and I uh, need to move that image around, that will change the positioning of that image on all the other containers. So generally by default, uh, if I'm doing this, I have it set to fill. Um, but if you're using repeated image, it's a really powerful way to automate that across other components. So, uh, oh yes, one more thing. Um, when you need to fix a mess, um, let's say you have a, a whole file where you've assigned a hex yellow color that doesn't have a style. Um, if this happens, um, you can either select uh, all the layers in the document, or you can select the affected layers. In this case, I'll just select all the layers by pressing uh, Command A. There's a section here called Selection Colors. You can actually see both all the styles that are used 
both your own and reference from other documents. And then you can see all the other colors that are available. And if you identify, if you know the problem color that you need to replace. So for example, I see this yellow that looks familiar. You can select your styles. And I, I'm pretty sure this is our friends of Figma yoke. And that will then replace that color uh, with the styled version. It's not as prominent here um, because I already have that yoke assigned. Um, but in the case where you, you've already built something and you just learned about styles and you realize, oh no, I have like a FOFO66 color all over my document. Um, I don't want to have to select every single layer. You can select everything and using selection colors, you can quickly see if there's something you miss. And oftentimes like I'll find them in the document, there was like, there was a color that got detached somehow. Um, I don't want to have to go searching for it. This is a really fast way to uh, find and replace it with the style. So that's kind of just a general thing on styles. There's a lot more in terms of styles that I just wouldn't be able to cover in one go. Um, in terms of component building, um, I'm going to get into a few things here. Components are quite complex. Um, I won't be able to cover everything with components, but I'm going to try and cover a few of the tips that will just make your building faster and more scalable. Um, so the main points I would say are build your components from small to largest. So follow your atomic structure, start from your small pieces and see if you can uh, fit those into more complex components rather than building those as separate things and then having to deal with the disconnect. Um, consider each element as a configurable piece. What I mean by that is, particularly when you're building your inventory or you start building your components, think of anything that potentially needs a change in state or anything that might need to be configured as you go along. Try not to hard code too much into your components. Um, there's now component properties that make it a lot easier for you to have like things that can toggle to show and hide or even a uh, specific content that's replaceable. So consider that when you're building, it's very important. Um, and try to get the most value out of the least things. So if you see two components that look like they could be made as one component, um, do that where it's sustainable. It can really change uh, the velocity at which you build, um, particularly you know when you need to change things from the source. The less things you need to change to impact everything down the line, the better. And nesting is a really, really powerful tool where you can nest a component within another component, uh, where you can have all of these wonderful outputs, but still manage it at a single source. So going back to this, um, this page uh, and looking at uh, how we build this from, in terms of components, um, we've built our styles and we've built our colors. So now it's, I don't think it will be uh, very difficult to get the basic components going. So I'm just going to go through my process for building these, um, building these components. Um, uh, there's a few things I want to highlight in the way. Um, so I've already set up a few icons here. Uh, I got these icons from uh, an open source library called Phosphor Icons. Um, I'm happy to link it at the end. I think it's an amazing uh, library of icons um, and they also have a, a really helpful plugin you can either link the library or you can run the phosphor icons plugin and once that's open um, you can search different strokes um, thicknesses and it has just a really fantastic repository uh, so i i got these from phosphor so taking a quick look at this um so I, I'm going to I'm going to pick a few components and start building them real quick. Um, so I think that's the best way just to show kind of uh, how how I kind of uh, my process in putting these things together. Um, so uh, I see we have this balance, this current uh, current account title and account details. I figure I'll have this as one component. Um, so what I'll do is maybe I'll start it down here. Um, uh, I'll put in I'll put in my my value first. Um, so two four four dot nine zero. Um, maybe have that as a display. Maybe like a H two. I probably would need a display uh, title for this. Um, current. Oh, oh dear. Where did I go? Oh, 
there we go. And so current eight, and I actually I've I've seen now that my my default is working against me. So I'm just going to go back and go back into edit and set default properties. And then I'm going to duplicate that by option dragging. And then I'm going to I need a I need a down carrot arrow. So I'm going to press shift I go back to components. Uh, I know this component is called carrot down. Oh, I don't have a carrot down. Ah, there it is. I forgot to make it a component. If you have something and you want to make it a component, by the way, uh, you can quickly uh, press Option Command K, um, and that will. If you have something that was supposed to be a component, like in this case, um, you can quickly componentize it. Uh, and I'm going to Option drag that down. But also, I could press Command uh, or I could press Shift I and search carrot down, and there it is. And then I'm going to quickly uh, auto layout this. Press X to separate uh, so these are kept evenly apart. Uh, and then I'm going to select all these three and auto layout these and press Option H. Uh, oh, is it? Ah, yes, it's this one. Um, to center align them. I'm not going to go too much into auto layout. Um, I think it's it's an hour and a half at least of its own. Um, so account details. And then we've got a card here. So if I ever have to build something like a card, and I think it's going to be used more than once, um, generally speaking, I start using generic terms. Uh, so we've got card title, uh, subtitle, and then there's that link. And because I've already built all these styles, I don't really have to worry about uh, setting any of these uh, fonts. And then Shift A, zero spacing, left aligned. And I see I've got a little icon there. Uh, I believe this is already in my icons. I think it's called balance. Yes. And I see it's in a round container. So I'll just Shift A. Uh, if I need something to be around, generally speaking, um, I can't. Yes. If I need a, a frame free round, generally I'll just set the radius as 999. Uh, it's faster than using a circle and it's also better practice because you're saying within auto layout. Um, then I'll align these two. And I see it's a little smaller here. So I'm going to hit this, press K, and then do type 0 0.5. This is a new update within Figma. They've updated scale tools. So you can just, instead of having to drag scale, you can just hit K and press the integer value. It's amazing. Um, and that's my card pretty much. Uh, I might just give it a, some padding and an outline. Maybe 16 and eight stroke. And even with my stroke value, uh, I didn't set a pure black in this case. So what I might do is I might just um, set a linked block. I prefer to do that than just setting zero, 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 because if, if I ever want to change that to something that's like an off black, I'll have this uh, already set up. And these guys, I actually made a mistake here. And um, I will set this to text primary. Perfect. So. You can see, like, I can put together these things quite fast now that I've built up my styles. Um, I don't have to be worrying about, like, oh, what font was that again? Like, do I have to check on that again? Um, and I'm quickly building up thing, uh, building up parts of this um, that when I set up a frame and I can pull these in, it's kind of like just assembling the, the pieces. Um, so I see I've got buttons. And in the original uh, file, these were two separate components. So I kind of wanted to talk about buttons a bit because they're so ubiquitous. Um, I was previously setting up a button component here. Um, so I'll actually just, um, I'll just call this X because I'm going to start rebuilding this again because I think with buttons, with component properties, the way we construct these sorts of components has changed quite a bit. 
you don't have to be building like dozens and dozens of individual uh, variants based on the, the properties of the button. Um, so I'll give you an example. Um, I'm going to set this uh, text primary button font, auto layout 24, uh, 8. So I'm going to call this button and command option K. Uh, give this a fill with our primary color. And actually, I and as you go along, you might realize, oh, I forgot to set a white. So what I'll do is I'll I'll detach that color. Um, I'll set FFF and I'll set my bank white again. I just like setting this just in case. Um, oh, when I actually set my, I meant to set the text as that, but I have it. I have it saved. So bank white. So I can see there's two types of button here. There is a button with an icon on the left, and there is a search button, which I would consider a variant of this. Um, I could build like a variant with an icon on the left, with an icon on the right. I could even do like a, what some people call like a, like a base component, where I have like a version of the component with all the things, and then I build another component that's linked to this. I don't personally think base components are a good idea. I've been caught with them before. Things can go pretty wrong. Um, so what I generally do with something like this is I make it, I make a button with all the states. So I'm just shift eyeing and getting my icons in there. I'm lazy. So instead of selecting them individually, I'm going to identify that zero, zero, zero color and just set my white. Um, Actually, I've made this padding a bit large. Whoops. So for now, like as far as I can see, there's a variant of this button that has these two icons, and uh, there might be a circle variant to this. I'm not sure if I can configure it this way because of the padding. But first of all, what I want to do is um, I want to configure this with properties. So I'm going to set this. Um, Oh, I should actually just explain what I'm doing. I do it so automatically sometimes. There's this little icon. When you select a, um, a, a, comp a component instance within a component, and you can set uh, an instance swap here. So I'm going to call this uh, left icon. And for by default, it's the carrot left. I'm going to set this as right icon with carrot right. I'm also going to set on the layer tab uh, another um, a boolean property so i want this to be show right icon and by default it's true and then show left icon and by default it's true and maybe i decide then by default actually it's false because maybe by default like the standard button won't show an icon but they're still there they're, they're still this i icon shows me that there is something in this structure so for example, now, if I drag an instance, instead of like having a component that's like the right icon version of the button or the left icon version of the button, and now I'm like, every time I shift I and search button, I'm um, having to look through like 12 versions of the button, I just drag my button. And if I want to have a right icon, it can have a right icon. Um, if I want the content to be different, um, if you use a command, a command click or control click to select the text layer, there's a content button here. Um, I can set this as a property. So I'm going to just going to call it content. And by default, the value maybe is button. So now uh, I don't have to click into anything here. I can just configure it on this, uh, this little menu here. Um, and so then the only other thing I might, uh, might decide on is, OK, I'm going to create a variant because I suspect with the padding that that's not, that's not going to be perfectly round uh, with just an icon. So let's see. Um, I know there's an icon in here. So um, how will I make that show? Oh, the link. This is a strange thing. OK. Um, in that case, I'm going to set uh, a carrot right in here that's hidden by default and shows
Um, what is going on here? If you guys can see what's going on. Yeah, so on your second button, uh, if you go into, yeah, yeah so if you go into uh, on your left-hand panel where it says icon, if you drop down that mm. list, and then you just, um, if you just detach, Oh, you can't detach because it's within the the item. Okay, so yeah, drag so this, so drag it out of the. Uh, what I would probably do is drag it out of the component set, detach it, um, and then is, bring it, yeah, and then bring it back into the set, uh, which you, uh, make it a new component and then de yes. bring it back to the set. There you go. So the way, yeah. So the way uh, that I would uh, use this yeah, is, you know, I just remembered now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like, just make so two actually, new components. Um, yeah, another way you could do this, and I could it's maybe showing my my rustiness, and I'm so used to having stuff already built, and I'm not used to starting from scratch. Let's imagine that we uh, we just built these two buttons separately; they're not components yet. Um, so I'm gonna fix up this width. Um, so that's a that's now a round button, and that's uh, with just the icon and let's uh go back into this button and so this is our this is our sort of do everything button and this is the version with just the icon and um, you can also set these up separately drag them together and select uh create component set which uh mitch was directing me to doing um so the only thing i have to set here is um uh i like to set my property uh title by by default to something like type or state so this is the default button, maybe, and this is like the icon button. Um, this, uh, so we just quickly go through these properties again. Uh, so show uh, icon left, and by default, that's false. And um, show icon right, and by default, that's false. And we set our content, content, and the only other thing uh, I forgot to do was if I go back to my actually I set these visible again and actually I want to make sure that these are configurable because we don't always want um, someone to have only uh, an icon uh, an arrow icon available okay great and then we can configure these to be false and this seems fussy, right? Like this seems like, oh, why would I do this? You know, um, but then once we have that base set up, um, we can select both of these option drag and and select a new property where um, we'll call this uh, button class maybe. Um, uh, and this is primary. And we're going to have secondary here. And maybe instead of the fill for the secondary, um, we have a stroke instead. And we set the colors with selection colors because you don't have to select layers. Now, we have kind of two versions here of the button. Um, we may also have size and different states. Um, and when it comes to actually documenting that button, um, you might you know drag instances of this out and make like, a left version and a right version. That's too much work. What we're going to do here is we're going to select this component. We're going to open our wonderful plugins tab, and we're going to run a plugin called PropStar, which I think is probably the greatest plugin uh, that's come out in the last year. Just by doing this, we can quickly see all the variants um, based on our states. Um, okay, we, we realize, okay, there might be uh, some properties that we have to check up on, uh, but we can quickly see like, when we get a lot of buttons going and um, what every version of that button will look like. And if there's something we missed out on, um, or there's like some oddities here, like we have to check the default color. It's just, it's so beautiful. It's just that such a fantastic incredible. way to, yeah, it's I, I cannot get over this. Like the amount again, it's one of those things you you don't realize you spend like hours creating this. I can't. I can't even tell you. Grid. I've had late. I've had late late nights that are now never going to happen ever again. I'm very grateful for that. <laughs>
Yeah, like actually, um, let me really quickly, if I can, I'm gonna pull, I'm gonna pull a window out. Um, give me one second, because I just wanna show you a more developed example of like just how powerful this is. Um, let me see. Gonna yeah, say I've immediately yes. saved that to my to my plugins list. <laughs> oh, it's just it's just the best. And the, and the, the nice thing is you can when you run the plugin, you can create either um, gives you an option. You can create an embedded table which creates a locked uh, grid, or a standalone table which lets you basically edit it and like, drag it around as a copy. So you can keep both types. It won't embed the original component. Um, it is it is just quite amazing. Um, so to give you like an example of like a more complex um, version, um, I'll just quickly pop this in. So here's like, here's a more complex version that I worked on um, where we have like different sizes, multiple states, but we can see, you know, um, there's like a text and icon version with each of the states. There's a text version with each of the states. There's an icon version with each of the states. It uh, took me so long to build beforehand to have this laid out, and I would still miss uh, certain variants. So, like, it is amazingly powerful. Um, but yeah, you can see by just a few tricks, like, we can quickly start building up something that looks like this. Um, but I'm going to move on real quick um, before we jump back to this. Um, uh, here's another really awesome hack that, like, I think people are aware of, um, but I also don't know if people are aware of, and I think people are doing it wrong. Um, a slot component. Um, if you're building, uh, particularly for like web interfaces, um, you're building lots of components, right? Um, that, like, or maybe like here's a title dialog uh, container, or here's like a confirmation prompt, or here's like a bunch of um, images. And let's let's actually give these uh, doggies. There we go. We love the doggies. Um, we could make components like we could make a component for this uh, container. We could make a component for this container. The problem is um, if suddenly I need to change the border radius of one of these, um, like maybe I need to make it like uh, a sharp edge container. I have to go to every single container and do the same thing. And if I'm dealing with like a more complex system, that is like a massive headache. Um, so what I recommend you do in this situation is uh, create a component um, that contains another component. So this is our container, and this is called slot. And slot is just a rectangle. And you go, Jamie, why do I have a rectangle inside of a component when I need like a full form? If you create this and then create all your content as components of their own, so here's that, you know, uh, title and uh, that's a budget card from earlier actually confirmation prompt photo reel oh here's like a complex form that we need to have inside of a container if you take an instance of that slot and you click into the slot there is an option where it shows a component name where you can uh, select uh, another component to replace it and you can still it doesn't affect the component itself uh, you're allowed to swap instances within components as long as you're not editing the content so uh, I change this to budgets and maybe I need to do a bit of a quick fixing to make stuff fit um, but now I have a container with not that um, with this inside and it's resizable because it's all auto layered and um, auto layouted uh, I decide then maybe I want my form so just have to quickly check that that's hugging the contents inside. And now I've got a form. I've still got the same container. <laughs> and in fact, <laughs> if I, I take the, oh, if I take the, uh, the border radius here and I adjust it on the master component. So I, I have the master component selected. Uh, this will adjust all the instances. So, and if I want to change, like maybe the background, this will adjust all the instances. So I'm changing one component up here and it's affecting everything else because these are all built 
as part of that uh, container card. And they all have that one slot inside, but within that slot, they have whatever you need. And you can just edit this. Like if you know you have a sign up form, you can quickly edit that master component. Um, and it it will affect whatever's in here. It's it's amazing. Um, now, the only caveat is I have seen some people uh, do it the other way where they have um, a container card and then they have like maybe like two or three, four slots and they hide it. And then they put like individual items in here. And so for example, if, if we have a, I think we, I've got a form, have I got a form input? Maybe not. Um, so for example, they, they put in a component in this slot and then they open up another slot and they put like uh, another component in this slot. You can do that. Um, but the problem is uh, you're very dependent on the slots that you have. And the problem is you can't reorder those uh, reorder those slots. So I would recommend build all your forms and build all your 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 organisms as single components and then just use your your single slot. And that way you, you can build um, this common container that will change when you change. Um, and also you can make these components. Uh, you can still have the confirmation dialog as a component. And the only thing is like inside that will be your container card and then whatever that slot is. Um, it's really powerful. So I only like, I only learned about slots recently and I'm still kind of mind blown by like how obvious it was, but also like how amazingly powerful it is after having spent so long going over like container after container. And uh, so I hope some people try that out and uh, see if they like it. Um, there is just one thing um, that comes up a lot, um, seeing as we're talking about building components uh, and kind of building smart. Uh, a lot of times I see um, drop downs and people build drop downs by, uh, you know, they, I have this already built. So they, they make their first uh, drop down rectangle and then they make a variant copy and then they maybe make some new rectangles underneath. And then what they do is like, so I've pre I've I've taken an instance and maybe I'll just pull it down to be clearer. I've taken an instance of that uh, opened copy and I've gone like thing one, ba 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 ba. So and I close it again so it's ready for my prototype, and I close this one which has thing one, thing two, thing three. And I close this, and I open my prototype. I've got all my options stored ready to go. And then it's like, wait, what happened? Where's my com where's my drop down items? Uh, but they're in this version. I I remember dealing with this problem with someone and it took so long to realize what was happening. So really important thing to do whenever you're building a variants of a component um, and you don't want this to bite you later on because you will waste so much time. These do not have the same structure. So in this component, I have a text and a carrot down in a box. And here I have, a, I have a, another frame, which is not the same thing. I have um, a list item, uh, and these aren't actually all linked to a component. These are two different layer structures. And what in Figma panics when you do this, if you, if you try to create a dropdown list and you don't have these like exactly the same structure and you make a copy of it, for the open state, uh, Figma forgets what was supposed to be in here. The right way to do this is to have in this, we've got a, okay, a frame nine, which is our container, and then a list, and this is hidden, and inside is our list. And then in the open version, we have frame nine, which is our container, and a list. Oh, wait, that's, I have an open, I'm looking at the same thing, but they are the same thing. That's why I got confused. Uh, so we have the frame nine container and a list. These are identical in structure. I have wasted so much time with things like this, not just with drop downs, but any kind of interactive component that seems to forget um, the, con the contents. Um, I just felt it was important to include this uh, because I'm sure I'm sure some of you have gone through this at least once. Absolutely. Um, so yep. I've run into yeah. that. <laughs> it's like, oh, uh, and, and it's, it's so not obvious. And you're thinking maybe if I just like write the information, information in 
and then paste it in or if I do something, it never works. They have Figma, it's, it will not remember. It, how, could, how could you expect it to remember? Um, so that's one to remember because drop downs in particular, uh, they pop up all the time and they're such a time waster and we're all about saving time and just like getting it right the first time. And also another thing um, that you have to be careful of when you're building your components, um, these look exactly the same, but they're not. This was built with, I believe, a frame, and this was built with an auto layout. So if I take these two, oops, if I take these two and detach them, secret is revealed. We have an auto layout here, which you can tell by the three lines and a frame here. Problem with that is I can do this and this will fit into any content. This will not do that. Um, this is a nasty little bugger. It's a fixed, uh, it'll either hug or be fixed width, but it won't actually do anything. There's very little you can do to make this work. Uh, it will not behave. Um, you can get it to hug, but then it's just going to go outside of whatever you've done. It's very much fixed. So when you're building, just be really careful. Try to build with only auto layout layers. Um, but having said that, Frames are still important and they're essential. Don't think just because all their layout will work for you know, components that frames are redundant. Um, so I'm gonna give you this example. Um, so I've got a frame here and I've also got this content. So I'm gonna build this content as an auto layout frame and I'll take my background primary and then I'm done. And it's like, great, I've got my, what, what do I need frames for? Frames are dead, auto layout all the way. The problem with this is um, if I want to resize this container, um, suddenly I'm thinking, oh no, uh, I can't move my little nav bar. It's like in this auto layout, but not a problem because I can fix it on the uh, bottom of the frame, right? Oh no, there is no frame. The important thing to remember, and uh, I think when you when you learn it the first time, you'll never forget it, but it can just waste time, is when you're actually building for prototypes, um, you'll probably want something like this status bar on the top of your frame. And I'll just use W and H. That's option W to top the line and option H to horizontally align. And you'll want your nav bar. So, oops, I'll dra drag that in. So option H and option S. We don't want to be dragging things into position. There's no time for that. On a frame, we can fix these. Um, in theory. Well, we could fix these in theory, except I can't find the uh ah, uh, it's because we're in a we're a frame in a frame. Oops. There we go. So we can fix this, set the constraint to top. We can fix this and set the constraint to bottom. And then we can take uh, that juicy doggo content, put that in our frame. And then, uh, so just to highlight, if I prototype with this um, auto layout, I'm kind of stuck with this not working, not scrolling uh, deal. But if I prototype with this and then I set this content to vertically scroll i just make your oh, frame yes. a bit shorter yeah yes then i have that classic status bar up here nav bar down there look maybe some of you know this already but like so many times i've seen people going oh no i, I my things aren't working i can't get this to stick i can't get that you know I can get this to work and they end up wasting time and um, when they're building something when they really should be just focusing on like moving on ahead and just knowing this and it when when it's obvious like that you know how frames work auto layout is a bit like um like uh like a very nice neat like lego stack and frames are sort of like this kind of like layer on top that holds everything together and gives things anchor points um yeah the frames are still essential even but just don't build components with them um, and also another thing that um, that nobody ever told me um, that I only learned from uh, a member of this audience, like very embarrassingly recently, 
is if you have uh, something like your nav bar and you set it to uh, bottom constraint, and I will drag this out for to make it a proper frame. You set that to a bottom constraint and you fix it when you're scrolling. You can give the dev handoff like screen, like a really super long version of the phone screen. Um, but when you actually prototype it, when you actually prototype it, uh, it will still show on the bottom of whatever device uh, you set in your prototype frame. Um, oh, right. So set it to 812. And uh, yes, I didn't actually set my prototype device. Uh, so 375 by 812. It will it will say it will say at the bottom of that screen. I used to waste so much time um, making like a version of the screen for the prototypes that was like uh, exactly the size and making sure that was like stuck there. I didn't realize the whole time like I could just have all the screens like dragged out like this and the prototype will still show perfectly. So that's another like it's another not super obvious but like amazing time saving thing. Um, Okay, uh, so uh, another the prototype. Um, so we go back to our our lo-fi sketch. Um, so okay, we're at we're at a stage where we can comfortably build these pieces, and we've built some of the pieces. I'm not going to build the whole thing, but now we have our buttons. Uh, this panel will take no time at all to build. It's probably just a a, a component for, or the a, a layer for price, a layer for text. We've got our card sorted. We just have to create content for the button and the text. That's done. But then we come across this, and I see this quite a lot where people are building prototypes and they have like a radio button, and clicking the radio button makes something appear, and clicking the other option makes something else appear. And they're like, they're building these frames and trying to like keep it consistent each time. And then suddenly it's like, oh, I actually want, like someone said, you know, uh, that needs to be like schedule instead of cycle. Oh no, now I have to go and like, I have to go to each frame. Where are the frames again? Okay, uh, it was over here. It's it's a big waste of time. What we really should do is we should look at this as a potential for building a smart component that will just do this work for us. And we have a single source that we can fix. So what we do in this case is let's make a copy of this out here real quick. So components that you build, they don't just have to be like discrete kind of discrete pieces of like, what I mean is they don't have to be discrete pieces like cards or buttons. A component is essentially just a reusable element that can be changed. A component can be a text layer and I have used text layers as components many times. Um, so in this case, uh, I see we need a radio button, we need a list of radio buttons, and when those radio buttons are clicked, something appears. So uh, if we just set um, weekly, let's make a really hacky radio button here. Um, stroke, oops, stroke, fill. We make a version with the fill, set it to stroke. And uh, maybe we set this as our block. In fact, uh, we'll set that as our block. And we'll set that as our font prime, text primary. And we'll set this as our key. So automatically, even when I'm building components, like I'm instantly thinking, you know, um, what needs to be styled. Uh, is this all set up now so that if I select everything here, all the selection colors are like linked, text is linked, perfect. Um, so I'll quickly make a component set out of this. So that's the radio button. Then I'll set this. I'll make another one called monthly. I'll quickly um, I'll set this so that... Uh, actually, no, I won't set anything prototyping just yet. I'll build a thing first. Um, so I'm thinking logically here, uh, what do we need? Um, we need a list here that says weekly or monthly. And um, we'll just take this piece uh, real quick. So I'll set this to P. And I'll set this to P. 
I'll just quickly select everything and I just see in my selection colors, there's a color that's not there. I'll auto lay out all this. And let's, ah, so we see I'm fixed here. So just make sure that's, that's filled. That's hugging, that's hugging, or maybe that's filled. Let me drag the whole thing out. Okay. So now we, we've quickly put together our, our first piece of this component, and we'll call this maybe budget cycle. So we know that one of the selections is going to show this guy, which we'll just group for the sake of the presentation. So I'm going to put this guy in here, and let's go back up to that prototype. And we also see that we have a weekly selection here. So I'm going to quickly select that. And much like the button, we're just putting in all the states at the start. Whoa, we'll group that. So this is pretty much everything we expect to see in this in this particular piece. And by we're kind of building this, we don't have to build a new page. We just build what's inside the page. So I'm going to quickly create a variant of this. By default, um, your variants will likely go this way, but you can um, also drag them this way. You can also option drag. Let's drag this back up. And then quickly, we're going to go, OK, uh, our radio button. Sometimes if I want to select multiple uh, components in their different places, I'll, sele I'll control select or command select um, the inner layer of the component and then shift enter to go back. And then I can quickly change uh, the state of both of them. So for weekly, we want to control shift H to hide that layer. And for monthly, we want to control shift H or command shift H to hide that layer. And then again, I don't want to sometimes, I don't want to always click in from the outside. Sometimes I'll just command select a layer and go backwards. Weekly will go here. Monthly will go here. Again, I'm just like using, I'm using my, um, my, my shortcuts here to just quickly navigate the layers. And I believe monthly as well. So if we, um, Command and drag to select the inside there. And we pick, ah, oh, it's one thing we forgot. We want to hide these guys for both. So I'm just using shortcuts all the time. I have no time for right clicking. Select this, put this in here, play this prototype. Done. Now we don't have, oh, there's a dotted line there. Uh, it might be a pro it might be a prototype quirk. There's a um, we're on the same page. We don't have to build multiple frames. We now have some degree of interactivity. Um, we could even include the button in there um, in in maybe an inactive and active state. If we put the button in all three, like before. So let's say we just we just drag it in here. Um, drag it in here, drag it in here, and then maybe it's at fifty percent opacity. And we get rid of this one. And quickly jump into here. We're just really quickly building things um, and building things in a way that that's sustainable. And um, so presumably, okay, we would have, I don't know if this is our original button component, but at this stage we could get our button component and drop it in here. So we're we're building this sort of like nested component structure. Um, so if we were to get our button, for example. Um, and maybe it had that right icon, and we'll just double click uh, the option key and we'll check our alignment. Okay, we don't want that, we'll just use that. I can just select, command select these, and then this is a super shortcut uh, Control Alt Shift uh, V or Command Option Shift V. Uh, oh, I didn't, uh, I didn't copy it, of course. There we go. So just super quickly, like we just swapped out a, an old broken component. We now have something that comes into an active state. We can quickly link that to other things. 
this is as much of a component as like say a button or a radio button or a card so when you start thinking about components as like these these kind of powerful uh, elements that can do things for you like rather than you having to manually set things it's it's super powerful um so i uh, gosh i've gone through so much i mean uh you're there's, I will have this all available on the file. Um, uh, Mitch will link this file out. I'm sure he has already. Um, you're you're all free to kind of toy around and play around to see like how the properties and components work. Um, before I kind of finish off and and open the floor for everyone, um, I'm just going to go over some of those really super uh, shortcuts. Um, so the really handy ones, um, and probably have missed a few um, that I've mentioned already that I just use all the time is like option drag is just so great for basically like quickly making a copy of anything you can use it for getting instances of components and you can use it for just making copies uh you can detach instances by using command option b although please don't detach instances unless you have to it's uh it creates pain um you can also use command option o um, in the case where you have maybe uh, libraries that you need to jump into, normally you'd have to click assets and then click the book. You can just use command option O. Um, and also uh, a really cool feature, um, it has mixed results, I find, uh, depending on what replaces what. Um, but let's say you have a component and you want to quickly swap it out with something else. So this is, these uh, shortcuts are actually components that I built. Um, you can quickly... Uh, use command option and drag in an existing component it will try to retain the styles of the original component and um, sometimes that works well sometimes that doesn't in this case it worked pretty nicely um but in terms of like the best shortcuts like the things that i could not work figma without um shift i components plugins and widgets like at your disposal the search button uh the search bar is already ready to go you don't even have to think it's just like shift i but there's my button and uh command and shift is basically your everything button and shift command option v that's your paste to replace um amazingly powerful you can like if you were to select a bunch of layers in this page you can paste and replace everything provided it is uh, replaceable and then there's the layers um uh shortcut so if I'm on this, uh, if I'm on this uh, giant layer structure here, if I press enter, it's gonna, it's gonna drop down to like the next available uh, set, and then I go enter, it goes a level down again. This is really powerful if you select uh, uh, multiple components, and um, maybe using a find and replace or using a plugin for selecting all layers. You can quickly identify every single layer um, and then move through their levels. And if you're looking to replace like maybe 500 uh, components with the same name structure uh you can just use enter and shift enter to quickly jump back and forth between the layer levels and also really powerful one that's not used very often is if you just press the shift key um or the other shift key oh no where is it ah there we go um if you press um the uh forward shift i believe it is I, it's probably it isn't is it for it's back shift right I never know which one's forward and which one's back. It's it's this one. That one's backslash. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can end, you can quickly um oops. You can quickly jump to the parent uh, layers. Um you can also do that by using shift enter. Um I believe they do the same thing. Um then there's the other one. So layout grids. If you have grids available, um, so for example, if we had an eight pixel grid, which eight pixel grids for life. Um, you can quickly toggle that on and off with Shift G. Uh, Shift O is amazingly powerful. If something's like, if you can't identify a hidden layer, or you're trying to find where the boundaries of two layers are. So, for example, um, let's say we have this guy, uh, which is a white status bar, white background, and you're like, where does that go exactly? You can see the markers, but if you use Shift O, it's very clear. Um, really powerful um ninja mode uh command and back shift backslash uh, yeah backslash yeah <laughs> oh this key um you can hide the ui which is really great for presentations and then you can also use 
uh, command shift I, which I kind of call baby ninja mode because uh, you you're, you can hide the left hand panel. So if you don't really need to see all the layers and you just need an extra bit of screen real estate, you can also hide just one panel, but still keep your properties in the right hand side. And then finally, like super, super, super amazing stuff um, that like I take for granted every day. Um, Every time I open Figma on a new device or if I'm setting up Figma, I always uh, set the nudge amount to eight. Um, I tend to use an eight pixel grid and I tend to use spacings of eight pixels because it's just, it just, it works. And there's an article at the end in our little goodie bag that will explain that system. I really believe in that system. You can set your nudge and anything that works for you. Uh, and by big nudge, I mean, if you hold shift and jump left and right, um, by default, it's 10, but I think eight is the best. The fact you can configure it is fantastic. Um, and you can just command, uh, command slash nudge or go into preferences. Uh, for toggle states, if you use the variant names on off or true false, uh, you'll automatically get your um, toggle for the component. So for example, um, I made uh, this component for shortcut keys. And I have these set to true or false, and I can just quickly hide and show. And this is just like such a fast way of uh, configuring components. And um, another great one, um, if you select, all, if you've got this kind of crazy thing going on where you're just in hell with layers, um, if you select all your layers and then use option L or alt L, and you might have to go to a top level layer to really do it perfectly, uh, automatically collapses everything. So you're back to the top level. It's really, really nice. Uh, another really cool feature is if you have, um, if you need to change the title of multiple layers, so let's say, oh no, I forgot to call these all like slide one or slide two. Um, you can select a bunch of uh, frames or layers and command R, control R to rename. And what's really cool is um, you can, uh, you can replace the name completely, or you can keep the current name with a uh, notation. And so we want to call that slide, whatever the original title was. Now I retain the name and I get to append uh, it with uh, other stuff. Um, there's also some other really cool notation that you can use. Um, these are on, uh, I believe Mozilla has this. Um, I'll, I'll make sure to get a link to it. Um, but I have it kept here as well. So you can set uh, counters where all the layers go up in, in an increment. Uh, it's really amazing. Yeah, uh, that's that's pretty much like as much as I can kind of squeeze in. Um, I think to really cover uh, the details of all that I've talked about um, will take hours. Uh, I think there's just so much to to actually break down. I was surprised myself when I was going through some of the uh, the techniques. I'm just going scratching the surface um, on kind of ways that I've learned to speed up uh, my process with Figma. Um, I think a lot of it is so automatic. I have to remind myself, you know, that it's it's not that obvious. But I hope people have learned um, a few things here, and I hope uh, you know you'll take some of this into practice um, and get faster with your Figma. Uh, in the meantime. I have um, left a few handy links in our little gift bag. So uh, the plugins that I've mentioned, um, I have them linked here. So Propstar, these amazing style guide plugins. Another one that I uh, used today, uh, no numbers. Uh, I, had a, I had a frame that was like all these numbers. This will get rid of that and select layers. Um, I know Figma has find and replace, uh, but I think select layers is still incredibly powerful for when you want to identify a single layer um, that you know the name of and then you know, edit them en masse. Um, uh, on the eight pixel or eight point grid, uh, I've linked an article that kind of changed my life. Uh, someone who isn't like natively a visual designer, it really helped give like a sense of rhythm and proportion to everything uh, I do with interfaces. Um, some great copywriting examples in this link. I just thought this was a really cool little uh, read. And um, going on kind of good design intent, um, Defense of CSS has some really interesting um, patterns on how to create uh, sustainable CSS uh, that, that kind of is responsive and is future-proofed. And uh, finally, uh, Mitch, maybe you wanna cover um, the work that we're planning on doing. Sure. Um, there is one question from Brian, which we'll get to in a second. Oh, I just, I just want to yes. 
Um, I just want to mention this and incredible, man. Well done. It's uh, just so much. And I'm sure that when people go over the recording, they will uh, find things that they didn't even realize, uh, which I know I will. Um, so thank you so much for this. This is an insane amount of work to put together in a short amount of time. And uh, yeah, really impressive. I learned tons uh, myself. So I'm sure everyone else did too. Um, the form that we're talking about here, it's just a little four... Um, a little four field Google form that we've put together um, to ask uh, NGOs and charities within Ireland um, what they need. Um, considering that we have a wealth of designers uh, on the call, we are hoping that uh, some of some of the folks here would join us in doing some design for good. Uh, at Friends of Figma, we can't take on paid work. We can't uh, you know just work for ourselves. Um, other than just like our portfolios. So the one thing that we can do um, to make the world a little bit better is to uh, try and do some sort of pro bono design work um, for any charity. So if you know someone who works for an NGO or a charity that uh, might need flyers, uh, maybe a UI design, maybe just a piece of um, uh, social media, something um, that we can get involved with, we would love to We'd love to be involved in that. Um, the question from Brian is, uh, uh, what if I want to keep the button at the bottom? So this is uh, when we were talking about the um, the um, the component sets. Yes, that one. What if I want to okay. have the button at the bottom so it doesn't move down all the time? Mm -hmm. Um, so if you mean fixing it, uh, oh, I see, I see what you mean. So you want it so that the button isn't, uh, like magnetically attached to what's around it. So, um, I suppose the handiest way to do this, um, would be to, uh, set your height to fix and set your other elements, um, to the same height, but there is maybe a better way of doing it. Um, so if you go into each uh, variant and you uh, make an auto layout for the content up here so in this case this is auto layouted and actually uh really the best intent would be to do it at the start with your master layer and um, so now we have uh now we have the variants where there's an auto layout and you can kind of see from the dashed lines so you can see that this is one part and this is the other part if we set it, go into our alignment and we can use the X key or go into this uh, three dot menu and select spacing mode space between. In theory, if we now um, uh, double click, option double click, or is it command double click? Uh, where is Phil? Oh, yes, that's right. This isn't a frame. Um, so, so I think if we just, we, there we go. Yeah. Yeah, so providing your frame stays fixed and you're on a single fixed page, um, you have now set this uh, auto layout to space between. So it's it's saying this part of the auto layout and this part should be on opposite sides. So we can test now if we set this to the other variants. Um, hmm. I, I think to. in this case, you would have to set a fixed, uh, a fixed layer. Um, so we were to set these, there is probably a better way to do it. Or maybe actually, I know what I did wrong. I just didn't, uh, I didn't set these to space between. Uh, so that space between, that space between. Um, so let's just, let's just test this out. Really good question though. Um, And the reason I like to keep the button in this context uh, is because you have that extra degree of interactivity. You're basically getting multiple interactions by having the button become active and having this appear. It really kind of gives you multiple layers. So uh, let's try that again. So let's drag this out and drop. I guess we would have to fix these layers. Uh, so let's set them all to 600. That will probably do it. Oh, actually, we can just reset the overrides here. Okay, so that will work. It's not the best way. I'm sure there's a better way that I haven't immediately thought of. But if you fix the height 
and then set the content up here and the button to be space between, then you'll get you'll get what you want. So we'll go into our prototype here. Yeah, there we go. So we have the two options. We have the button say changing, but we have the button fixed at the bottom. The only other way I was thinking you might be able to do this is if you pulled the button out of the components and put it in its own frame. But that's if you want it to be fixed to the um, bottom of the yeah. page in your in your prototype. But I, I think a lot of what you've demonstrated here talks to the idea that the ideal um, development ready Figma file is slightly different to the ideal prototype ready Figma file. Right. Um, and so you you might even want to have a completely separate sort of um, you know duplicate page for your prototype versus what you hand over to Dev. Yeah, absolutely. So often when I'm um, setting up files for handoff, I'll have a separate page for handoff where I will have like these distinct three frames, and I'll describe like when this button is pressed, the screen will look like this. When the button's pressed, the screen will look like that. You really want a more like one to one static representation. So in that case, um, yeah, in that case, I would take out the button out of these three layers and have it like fixed onto the page. So in this case, we'll just um, we'll just tie these uh, buttons or move them and we'll reset our layout. And then if we take our button in this state, um, yes, you can you can set um, your button. Oh, we're on a frame. Yes. So in this case, then you can set your button. In fact, uh, I'll just press zero for full opacity. And if I paste it, it'll paste in the same place. Then you can have it every way. Um, I still would say, though, even if you didn't have the button, um, like I would go as far as if I knew if I knew this was going to be like depends on how often you reuse something. If I knew this was going to be a, a, like a type of uh, component that I was going to be using a lot, or this particular text is going to be repeated, I would go as far as like going back up here, setting this as a component, saying like text dot budget, um, and then selecting these, replacing these, and then. If I like need to change that, it changes it below. You'll you'll kind of get a feel over time for like how granular do I need to make components? How like when is it appropriate to have say a button as part of this or something like this where you know the button is a separate component? And I do think it changes for prototypes versus handoff screens because with handoff screens they're intended to be static representations, whereas a lot of times with prototypes you can have like you know an overlay up here that's just a, a lone rectangle sitting outside of the frame. Um, so yeah, I think it depends It depends on your context, but there's always like more than one way to get around it. I think the key though is like, you just want to set it up so that you do the least amount of work at the end, that you're not manually having to like manually, you know, change pieces over and over again, no matter what you're doing. Awesome, well done, Jamie, incredible, incredible tips and tricks um uh, just yeah this is definitely our best session and uh, thank you so much for presenting this yeah absolutely it was, it was a pleasure awesome guys okay well we're going to leave it at that because we are right on time um unless anyone has any burning questions Okay, well, if you do, uh, please get us on Slack. Uh, if you haven't already joined the Slack channel, please do so. We're, we're sort of not really asking everyone on Discord. Uh, Mary says, thank you so much. You are awesome, well done. Thanks, Mary. Um, as does Sharon. And uh, yeah, if you guys uh, wanna join us again, we'll, uh, we, we haven't really got a schedule yet. But we're kind of thinking every Thursday, every other Thursday. And if you would like to present something, if you've got something you'd love to share with the group, Please go ahead. It's not just the two of us talking rubbish all day. Uh, yeah, and uh, I hope you have an awesome evening.